So basically, we're looking through Google's lens or Internet Explorer's lens. Um, blockchain, so it's, okay, so the Internet is like an information machine. Blockchain is like a trust machine where it's a decentralized access point to information okay. that in a way validates the trust. Hey guys, it's Mandy with Global Hemp Association. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining. I'm excited about the opportunity to build a relationship and connect this supply chain. I mean, after all, that's why we started the association. Our association was built on the foundation of connecting supply chain, building relationships, and helping you grow your business. Anyone from farmers, manufacturers, and distributors, people that are passionate about the supply chain, and those creating products selling into biofuels, plastics, textiles, construction, and building materials. What's okay. going on? <laughs> this is a topic that keeps coming up. But before we get started on what we're going to dive into and the blockchain and the crypto and how it can be used in the industry, I'm excited to hear a little bit about your background. How'd you get into this? What are you doing right now? And what really fuels this fire within this industry to keep going? You know, what gives you your grit? Geez, so much. Uh, I've had cannabis in my world since I was about 12. And I've been a plant nut for just as long, which I got from originally my grandmother in France. So two passions of mine are plants and disruptive tech or tech in general. I like it. So right now, um, that leads to today, and I am the chief of field operations for Acknowledge Farms and head grower for Acknowledge Farms in Knoxville, Maryland. Uh, we are a organic, biodynamic, centric cannabis farm, and slowly kind of incorporating some Jadam practices in that mix as well. What, explain what that means. So Jadam is coming out of South Korea. Okay. It's a basically an anaerobic fermentation practice or um, processes in, in which rural farmers can create everything they need to farm for the year using things that are readily available to them at their farm. Rural farmers are usually far from stores, places where they can buy things that they need. So it's a, it's a methodology and, and processes available to kind of create things using basically plants, soil, and water. Okay. So you, you can create fertilizers, pesticides of all kinds, fungicides, and some other things just using um, anaerobic fermentation. And nice. so I'm trying, part of my mission is to try and scale the processes just a little bit it, in order to do acreage. Uh, we're farming at Acknowledge roughly around four acres a year currently. And you're, you're farming for what? What specifically? We are farming for predominantly cannabinoid extraction. Okay. Cannabinoid and terpene extraction. Uh, we do do a little bit of raw flour, but we're still kind of navigating that part and that marketplace. Sure. And so that is where we're at at Acknowledge. Now, as far as disruptive tech goes, I've been into blockchain stuff for probably just as long as folks have had have heard about Bitcoin. So around 2014 is probably when I first heard about it. And I dabbled a little bit there. Long story short, lost all, all what I had at that time, um, just access really. And then later around 2017 kind of re-entered the engagement and learning more about blockchain and crypto and 
then right around 2019, NFT technology came around um, in my purview anyway. And so had been looking at it and really started getting in, diving into NFT tech uh, more recently. Um, so part of that whole grasping for me during that time of 2014 and learning about blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and crypto cryptography really stemmed from just my upbringing and not really being affluent financially and just really from an early age wanting to know and learn about economy and personal finance. And so trying to understand those for myself and manage those for myself from an early age. So that goes hand in hand with blockchain tech and cryptocurrencies. And, and so that's um, where my, my interest is. Okay, so for those that may not know or understand, break down in, in English, simple English for me, what's, what is blockchain compared to crypto? What are there? They're so, you know, as we talked earlier before we went live and the adoption of blockchain or cryptocurrency is still scary for some people or still, you know, they're a little bit unsure. It's not tangible. How did they don't understand it? Right. So help me understand and help me explain it to them. <laughs> right. It's so there, there it's a space that's moving quite fast and we were talking earlier, every, it seems like hour, there's new information to digest. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, cryptocurrencies, we'll start there. It's a current, they're currencies, just like the U S dollar, just like the Euro. Those are all currencies or mediums of exchange. Even gold is a medium of exchange. So cryptocurrencies are just that. There are mediums of exchanges for goods and services. Um, now, blockchain is a little bit more in depth, mm -hmm. but I the, the more I read about it and the more I understand about it, it's similar to, it's an unalterable public record keeping system that's validated by thousands and thousands of computers. So it's a decentralized record keeping system that can never be altered, that lives on the internet. The internet is like an information machine. We access it for information, but most of what we access on the internet is coming from a centralized source. So when we get on the internet, a lot of us, are on Google Chrome, per se, or another browser, Internet Explorer. Mm -hmm. Those are for-profit companies that are, are giving you software, uh, this, these web browsers, to access the Internet. So, and a lot of folks use, like, Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, Wikipedia... It, you know, has all the information there and you can subscribe, subscribe and publish and alter, alter the information there. But that lives on um, on these browsers that we access um, in a big way. So there is a, a, a centralized uh, window that we're viewing. So basically, we're looking through Google's lens or Internet Explorer's lens. Um, blockchain, so it's, okay, so the internet is like an information machine. Blockchain is like a trust machine where it's a decentralized access point to information okay. that in a way validates the trust in what we're actually seeing. So... Let, let me stop there and say, does that make, does that, is that making sense? Yeah. Yeah. We just had an aha moment. 
I finally get it. Just had an aha moment. So the way you're explaining it is obviously working. So yes, absolutely. I had somebody explain it like one is the inter- like the internet. Blockchain is like the internet. And the crypto is like the app that runs on that blockchain, right? It's not an internet. I like how you explained the difference between the internet and the blockchain, right? But that it is the fundamental or foundational piece for all of these apps or cryptos or coins to be traded on. Right, right. And it's nonprofit. It's open source. Uh, it's secured. It's it's very secured. And, and again, this idea of an unalterable record keeping system is uh, incredible. And throughout my conversations with folks, you know, literally we'd have to destroy the internet to get rid of the blockchain, um, which is, is very close to a meteor hitting the earth and wiping us all out for that target. So it's, you know, slim, slim chance. Um, now that, that, so you, you're, you're on the right path there. Like crypto is the medium of exchange in the real world. And then also the digital world. Sure. So that is in a nutshell, kind of how it is now. Another example I like to use for blockchain and explaining blockchain is, and crypto, is this idea, this service that's provided by banks. So right now, if I wanted to buy that cool hat from you, I would have to send you twenty dollars or, or forty let let a hundred dollars, right? I'm like that for closer to twenty, but it's cool. <laughs> all right, all right. So I'm gonna send you twenty dollars out of my bank account. Now my bank, I'm gonna trust them to record that transaction, record my new account amount, and then you're gonna trust your bank to do the same for you. Record that transaction, record your new account mm-hmm. amount. Now that's a lot of trust for us. And then also a lot of inter intermediary, like middlemen yeah. in the process. So there's also, there's computers there doing that f- for us today. Uh, not too long ago, it was humans mm-hmm. and there's still some humans there doing that. Um, so humans are prone to errors occasionally. <laughs> Um, call it too. <laughs> or sticky fingers. <laughs> right. So if on the blockchain, we could, I could send you a cryptocurrency for that hat of an equivalent mm-hmm. value direct. And so we then become the bank and we're then now trusting the blockchain to validate all those things to validate the transaction, to make sure I'm me and you're you, to make sure I've got the 20 and that it's going to your wallet. And it's, if there's any discrepancy, it won't let that happen. Now, if everything looks good, that transaction will happen and it's gonna be verified by thousands of computers and it's direct. So we're, basically getting rid of these middlemen and that service that's offered by banks is slowly becoming outdated is what we're seeing. And so other services similar to that um, are coming around and slowly kind of we're identifying these services and these service providers that, we can do direct. We can do peer to peer. Now we don't necessarily need those services offered. Yeah. Jeff just made a really good comment that I just saw centralized systems, given edit powers, give edit powers to individuals, bank ledgers, for instance, blockchain can be, cannot be altered in this way. I think that that's just it is even though things are automatically being uploaded or done and there's less people, you know, manually entering, there is still ability to make that change. And I think there's a huge difference there in security and the transaction. 
and then even to feed further into NFTs and how this you know directly impacts the industry. And right. Again, it's that unalterable record system that it, it's for 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 me especially. It's just like incredible, um, and also. You know, we can't, it, it, it's that level of trust more and more where we're losing trust with these entities that we deal with in our physical lives every day. Uh, and so we, as humans in a species are looking for trust. We, we thrive on it and there's the blockchain can't lie. It, it's a public record for everybody to see at any time, for all time, as long as the internet exists. And it can't be altered by anybody. Right. So, yeah, it's it's digital trust. It, well, and, and I like also because it gives a more direct connection and a more honest pay back to the original producer, right? So whether it's the farm or the genetics or the whatever piece along this supply chain, it eliminates this price increase or profit margin that's unnecessary and, or I guess redistributes that profit margin back where it is necessary. Right, right. And that, again, there's so much coming out every hour almost, it seems that digesting this stuff is, it takes a lot. But with NFT technology coming out, what you just said also gets my mind going because there's just so much to incorporate with with that and we are learning literally in real time the powers of this technology and how people can kind of become these certain service providers themselves yeah. and in a way mitigate a lot of what we are familiar with in these old legacy systems um as far as losing time and in, 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 in researching, in promoting, in marketing, in rights, um, so many, so many aspects of it. It's just hard to kind of contain um, for me just because I'm always thinking about it. My mind's moving like a million miles a minute. Okay, so I read an article. I had one of my members and advisors send me an email this morning with a a letter that, or an article that was published by, I think, uh, CNBC. And it says, there's a couple of quotes on here that climate change is a business opportunity. And the whole article talks about um, that it's going to require innovation, large amounts of integrity, capital, and innovation. And this is where we play such a big role or where technology like blockchain or crypto or NFTs play such a huge role in exactly what people are, are addressing, right, on a much larger scale. I think the article even said something like uh, the next 1,000 billion or billionaire, well, the next 1,000, 1 billion startups will be clean catch companies is what the article says. And so, again, going back to, you know, where does this play a role specifically in these type of scenarios? And can you explain what NFTs are? Sure. Wow. That, yeah, those are two giant um, things to unpack there. Um, and the carbon markets are just going bananas right now, uh, mm -hmm. especially with the, the G conference going on, or, or I don't know if it ended, um, but I was wow. reading just, just a tidbit, like carbon credits hit an all time high, mm -hmm. like last week or something. And, you know, there's, a supply of carbon credits that does not equal demand uh, for 2020 and even this year, potentially um, there's basically not enough carbon credits available for companies to keep op operating the way, you know, like, you know, business as usual, so to speak. So is that you know, because of penalties due to carbon footprint or why? What do you mean? Well, so companies that, are producing companies need carbon offsets in different ways. Right. They are like producing either, you know, pollution or whatever it is where they need to offset by buying carbon credits or creating them 
in different ways, and ba- mostly by buying them uh, in order to operate, you know, like usual. And so more and more companies are going are having to include in their bottom line carbon credit buying in order to just keep operating uh, because their industry or their business is just inherently, um, you know, putting, putting carbon out there. Mm-hmm. So carbon it, there, blockchain and, and crypto and NFT tech plays different roles in the carbon industries. Um, and so, this, this this is like the juice for me. So one thing that me and a bunch of other folks, and I talk about this sometimes, um, think the direction for, let's just say, gathering carbon data on site, on a farm. Mm-hmm. We can imagine as farmers now that there's going to be a day where there's going to be sensors that you stick in the ground and in real time, those things are just sending data to, to, to a chain, to a blockchain and recording in real time, unalterable um, parameters. And so we'll be able to in real time see potentially how much carbon is being sequestered in different ways. That's one use case. Um, another use case in that same vein um, is the USDA organic certification. We can, as farmers today, imagine that one day there's going to be similar sensors on farm, sending parameters on chain in real time that is going to basically give the whole layout of the soil matrix, pesticide use, toxicology, heavy metals, all the things, maybe even humus concentration, uh, some positives, moisture content. Um, I would imagine it would help also track drift, drift, um, not drift crops, but when the fertilizer drifts or. Right, right, chemical drift. There you go, yep. Right, right. There, I mean, for sure, we have, we can, I, well, we can imagine like soil sensors, we can imagine air sensors, wind sensors, um, we can imagine light sensors and moisture sensors. And so all we these can imagine, are- like these are real discussions. I think this is where like we are, it's, it's no longer a figment of our imagination. And these conversations are no longer so far ahead. Like we have these conversations and we have people actively involved that are using technology similar to this on test plots or pilot programs. And so, yes, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. We say imagine, but it, it's really right around the corner, right? It's a matter of open up and let's try to wrap our mind around this. Exactly. Exactly. This time, what a time to be alive. We are in a time period where we're literally creating in real time, the use cases, the scenarios, and it all starts with imagination. We have to be able to conceptualize before most of the time we, we have to conceptualize before we manifest. So that's where we're at with this stuff. The tech is so young still. And I, I have talked to some people. They, you know, they're like, Ryan, I feel late to the game almost just because it's been around for almost a decade, you know, six or seven years. And we are still so early. Um, we were talking before we were using the analogy of, or, or how I kind of related it to the, um, corded telephones. Yeah. Which when you were telling me that story, I have to be serious. My kids one day, just not very long ago said, Hey mom, you think we can get one of those antique phones? And I laughed and I was like, yeah, I'm sure I could get one from mom. My grandma, my great grandma has one. She goes, no, no, you know, the kind you plug in the wall and you have to push the button. And I was like, antique. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so carry on with your antique phone story. <laughs> right. You know, all these 100 just sounds totally different nowadays. <laughs> but 
having the phone, the corded phone back in the day, and then living through that transition period of the cord disappeared. And slowly our PCs went from the desk to our pockets. Mm -hmm. So now we have a smartphones that can do it all. But that took literally, we're, all, we're in like 30 years right now, maybe even closer to 40. In the, in the early 90s, we still had corded phones um, all over the place. So that's kind of, a, in my mind, the time frame we're looking at as far as the acceleration of all these things surrounding this new technology. So we're here on year six or seven of its adoption starting. And we still have, in my mind, a lot of time to go. And there's so much to digest, like I was saying, that it, it just it's going to take time. And in that time period of the early 90s, a lot of effort, a lot of resources, and even into the 2000s and even into today, a lot of effort, energy, and resources went into basically making this internet accessible for people like me and you so that today we take it for granted. We hop on Google, type in, push enter, and we're on, the, we're on our way or we're on Gmail and sending emails back and forth to everybody or we're here live. You know, 30, 30 years ago, this was like, this was kind of sci-fi almost. So... It's that time frame, maybe a little bit accelerated. So maybe, you know, we'll see some real innovation really manifesting here in the next five to 10 years, but we're still very early and the tech is still very, very early. Yeah. So we're learning and we're just imagining and creating this stuff in real time, figuring out use cases for this technology every day. I love it. Well, there are some great comments that I'd like to address Address, someone asked earlier, and I wanted to bring this up, is what gives currency its value? Geez, that's a good question. And the short answer is us. Okay. Um, how is that? How does it work? You know, currency is a medium of exchange. So it's, it's always been us that has put the value on something. Now, that has, over the years, taken different forms. And some forms that we feel safer with that idea is that the currency is backed by something. So we were, for a while, uh, in this, I, we're here in the United States, but in the United States, our currency was backed by gold for a while, I think until... The late 60s, I got to double check that. Um, don't quote me there. But um, it, it's, it's, it's really us that puts the value on it. Nowadays, you know, gold, when you, when you look at gold, and I'll, I'll just pick on gold for a second. Gold doesn't necessarily have a lot of utility. Now, you can use it in different um, chips, microchips, things like that, there is some utility there. Like as a metal, gold has unique properties. Um, but as like a, a currency or a medium of exchange, well, what are you going to do with a rock? Um, it's, it's really just people that put the value on it. So there are different ways to value things. And there are different metrics and parameters. Now with, let's circle back to cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrencies have different parameters and metrics that give them value. Some are pegged to like the US dollar. So there are cryptocurrencies out there that are one-to-one -one with the US dollar. If the US dollar is going up, then that cryptocurrency is going up. If it's Going down, that cryptocurrency is going down in value to the rest of the currencies in, on Earth. And it's always going to be one to one. So one USD, one US dollar is going to be one of these cryptocurrencies. Let's say one of these cryptocurrencies. 
So there, there's a there's pegged um, cryptocurrencies, usually called like stable stable coins, mm-hmm. and they can be pegged to different things. And there are other metrics and parameters. Sometimes the value is increased by different things. If a currency is scarce, for example, um, that may increase its value, meaning like if there's less of a supply. Now, if there's more of a supply, the value deteriorates or goes down. Uh, There's one, and I'm gonna gonna throw out a, a number right now, but within the past year, Apparently, the U.S. has printed around 20% of all U.S. dollars ever printed in history. So when we look at that. That's a real number. (laughs) Yeah. And that's like a fifth of the (laughs) supply of U.S. dollars has been printed in the past year. Now. Again, I'm just throwing that out. Don't quote me there, but I'm pretty sure that's the understanding of uh, the majority of us out here. And there are, there are mechanics there at play. And so when you have such an increase like that, then the, the increase of the amount available, then it may impact the, pro- the value of that currency compared to the rest of the world and the rest of the world's value, you know, currencies. So that's where the terms like inflation come up. So yeah, uh, you know, some folks in the in the in the chat are commenting too. Yep. Um, and basically, like I was saying, a lot of the U.S. dollar has been printed in the past year. So that's devaluing the U.S. dollar a lot comparatively to other currencies. So that kind of thing, like value is a, is a giant conversation. What gives things value? And, you know, that's in a way we could even roll this into the NFT talk and understanding NFTs. Please. Yeah. So NFTs, what that acronym stands for is non-fungible token. So let's, Let's dissect that for a bit here. So fungible is replaceable. Non-fungible is irreplaceable. Token is something that represents something else. So a real simple analogy, and since it's the most copied art in history, is the Mona Lisa. The original Mona Lisa is irreplaceable. So it's non-fungible. Now, if we had a NFT that represented the Mona Lisa, the real one, that would be a non-fungible token of the real Mona Lisa. And we could assign the real Mona Lisa with a hash is what it's called. It's just a long string of letters and numbers. And basically, the token that that hash represents, that would be that would be representative of the original. And so whoever had that token per se would could it could be the owner of that physical item, the Mona Lisa. And so similar. Another analogy is your favorite shirt. So you may have a shirt from back in the day or a hat and it's your favorite, absolute favorite. Now you've been through all the times with that piece of clothing and made it so many memories. Now you can go to the store today and buy 20 of those shirts or hats, but they're not gonna be the same hat or shirt. They're not gonna carry that emotional value to you. So in a way, your favorite shirt is non-fungible. It's irreplaceable. Your favorite hat is non-fungible. Those other hats that you could buy that are the same hat, but don't have that emotional connection, those are fungible. Those are replaceable. You can buy those all day and you don't have a connection with them. So in that way, there's an emotional value there. 
Um, so again, kind of circling back to how value and what gives things value, there, there's different levels of value. And that would be one example of why and what are NFTs. And you could create a token to represent that favorite shirt. Basically, you could tokenize that favorite shirt, that favorite hat, and that would be an NFT, non-fungible token representation of your shirt or hat, your favorite. Or content, right? Or potentially a genetic, right? Right, right. That something, I mean, is that something that then could be used in say seed or, or genetics, you know, seed production and genetics and the sale and resale of that genetic. What does that look like? Well, at this point, it's very much open-ended. Again, we're kind of creating what this kind of looks like in real time. So okay. as far as like genetics or how I like to go, I'll circle back to the USDA organic uh, talk mm -hmm. is the certification could be tokenized, could be an NFT. So a farm goes through the processes of getting USDA certified, has those sensors brought onto the farm and are recording data real time. And that acknowledgement of passing that process and being USDA certified organic becomes an NFT that is related to the farm. And so the farm holds an NFT uh, representing that they are USDA certified organic. And then it's all verified on the public ledger, which is the blockchain that is unalterable. And everybody can look at real time data of that farm and see exactly what's going on there. And so if anybody slips up, everybody knows in real time. But if Okay. So right there, maybe a reason adoption's a little scary. Understanding understanding the um, lack of transparency that's been required within the industry and not just our industry. I, I guess I shouldn't say lack of transparency is because it seems like it's more and more sought after, right? But there are definitely a change or a shift in the way people are farming, on the way people are processing, on the way people are you know acting in business in general. Um, Jeff, thank you very much. He says... Boom, you're exactly right. Nailed it on the head. Exactly. And it's permission-based. That makes sense, right? So I assume then, are, are you saying, Dave, David, that you can, and maybe you know this, Ryan, can you decide whether or not I share that information? Right? You say it's public and everybody knows, but is there a way to share or not share, you know, and, and give access to that? So this is public. And once you're there, it's there for anybody to see. Anybody can log in. There are private blockchains. Mm. Now, the idea of blockchain technology is the heart of it is a decentralized open source, not for profit. Public ledger. So. Everyone on earth becomes basically the regulators, right? And so, you know, if you, it's kind of, that's a good question because if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to hide and nothing has to be private. Now, if there are things that have to be privatized, then there are avenues on the blockchain for that. I think with something for now, I'll just say my personal opinion on something that's, you know, in the public trust, such as like a USDA organic certification. As a consumer, when I go to the store and I look at a USDA certified organic product, I want to be able to trust that. Now, I knowing what I know, feel like I'll have more trust in the system where I can check in real time publicly. Anybody can check to see exactly what's going on there. Now, if it's privatized and I don't have access to information around that certification, I'm just naturally, I feel like, not gonna trust it as much as if I had access uh, at any time in real time to information that I was interested in. Well, as and more and more, that's where consumers are buying, right? Consumers want to know. And so it's 
you know, we've seen this shift in paradigm that we keep talking about, about who's driving that industry and the younger generations are willing to pay with their dollar and put their money where their mouth is. And they really are concerned about, you know, is the product ethically sourced? Where was it grown? Is it really being greenwashed? You know, what's this lie that we've all been told of what's actually biodegradable or, or recyclable or sustainable, whatever, right? All these buzzwords that we keep hearing. And so I do, I think it's going to be a consumer driven usage, I would assume. Well, both, right? But definitely consumers are who are driving the interest, I see. Right, right. I, that harkens on so many things, you know, again, trust of all these legacy systems that a lot of us were just born into yeah. that we don't have necessarily the foundation of trust that we'd like. So we're creating new foundations of trust with other systems. We're creating new systems. And as consumers, again, the power of the dollar, uh, we are in a time period where there is a huge emphasis on knowing your food, knowing your farmer, knowing your product what, as much as possible. Um, and maybe that's just us in our own little bubble, but I don't believe so. Just because as time marches on, we as a species, at least in my opinion right now, are making decisions less on the the options available and more on necessity. We are running out of options. And, and so we are making decisions on necessity to try and coexist uh, with our environment, with this thing that is life and this planet that's this rock that we're living on. And being able to survive, really, we don't want to make our home uninhabitable. Because uh, then, obviously, you know, the, the, the outcome is not good. <laughs> so, well, it's gotten there, right? It's finally in people's faces that it's there for some some people in some countries. Uninhabitable is a real, it's a it's a it's no longer distant in our concerns, right? It is even in the United States, we are being hit first, you know, right in the face with these real problems that just haven't been in the past. Right. It was right. easy to move ourselves. Right. Right. You know, it, it, you're right. And with the advent of the internet, we have in, instant information transfer. We're, you know, able to make calls and set up group calls in, in real time instantly to really share knowledge, exchange ideas. Uh, it, it's literally like the modern day saloon or, or bar where, you know, we all get together and just exchange all the, all the things, all the ideas. So, you know, it, it, we're able to share ideas and, and information so rapidly now that we can, we can all know. I mean, there's almost no excuse to not know what's going on. Um, so that's, that's one thing um, about NFT technology is, and just to circle it back, is incentivization. One powerful thing about NFT tech is the power to incentivize. How? What does that mean? Like how does that directly relate? So incentivization isn't new. Um, right. In so many things in our daily lives, we are being incentivized. Mm -hmm. If you get a card at wherever store, you gain points. You go to a restaurant, well, you can get the sandwich or you can get the meal. The meal, you get a little bit more and it's cheaper, hypothetically, if you, you, know, if you were to just buy those individual items as individual well, 500 items. 500 more calories, it's only a dollar. But if you only a dollar. Two, yes. For 50, <laughs> more grams, for 50 more grams of sugar, it's only 50 cents. So that, that idea is new or, or is not new uh, right. in summarization. Um, so to circle it into cannabis and, you know, why, why is NFT tech important to cannabis? Because we, we talked about blockchain tech being and how, how some avenues in the cannabis industries we can see, and you can expand on that, um, almost infinitely. 
But NFT technology, one super powerful thing that we're realizing that it can do is incentivize. So for there, there's two examples I like to give. One is for the consumer. Let's say you are a store, e-commerce or brick and mortar, and you're, you've got your daily deals, you've got the good prices, you've got the premium grade products, um, but so does everybody else. Everybody down the street has it. Everybody online's got it. And so how are you going to stand out? Well, one thing you could do is on top of your daily deal, on top of your premium product, on top of your good prices, is you could offer an NFT. And so if somebody comes into your store and spends a certain amount of money that day, they get an NFT that is limited in production. Maybe it's got some cool art. Maybe it's got access to something in the future. Maybe it's a redeemable in the store for a future discount. Or maybe it's just a collectible for to signify that you were there and that you supported that business. So does, does that get you going? I'm Are confused. You- I'm confused about, so can you set up as many NFTs as you want? So can anybody, so as a company grows, for example, and say they have, they hit a thousand, five, 5,000, 50,000, 100,000 customers, each of those customers could potentially have an NFT for each visit they attend. And then where would that value be tied? Like what would the value of that NFT be? What so be the benefit, I guess, is where I'm confused. So you could, you could. The scenario you suggested, it seems endless where every visit someone's getting an NFT or there's like an endless amount, but you set the limit. So there could be a exact amount. So your first, let's say your new store, the first 500 customers get the Genesis NFT of the store and there's only 500 available. And so that one is unique to the next NFT offering that, you're, that you potentially have. So um, you could potentially... And of course, when I listened to this, it was about like content, right? What we were tying it to or the cartoon video that explained that NFTs was directly related to artwork, um, right. the dollar. And so if I say for each video, there's an NFT, right? Now, how do other people have access to that NFT if they wanted to watch or purchase or license that video or that content or artwork? Okay, so... There are certain there are certain distinctions in, in parts of that question. So one thing, because I, I might have missed the beginning, but one thing is that these NFTs are backed by smart contracts. So if you are uh, if if you are diligent enough and know those coding languages, basically mostly Solidity, um, you can in these smart contracts write in these royalties or derivatives or licensing rights. Um, and so there are those that, and that aspect of it. I got you. So it's actually a contract attached to that NFT that would then allow access to that artwork or product or whatever, right? Right. Basically bridging the digital to the physical and all that we know as far as legal like rights. Number. I, it's, I, I look at this like a VIN number to a vehicle, right? That VIN number is registered, bought, sold based on that number, tracked, maintenance, whatever. Right, um, right. And then add that on a blockchain, there's no, no risk then at that point of buying a faltered vehicle because now it's NFT belongs to a blockchain. Is that right? Or on a blockchain, you, you could, you could. And everything that you need to know about that vehicle could be on a QR code and you That's can scan that code and read it, the entire vehicle history. Like and a contract report right on to blockchain. With exactly. The- okay. We are, instead of trusting Carfax to tell us all the facts, we're trusting the entire earth and all the computers like that are validating all the information as it's being received. Now that, that's again, so to that point, um, you, you could do that. And so tokenizing really anything is possible. Now we could get really deep 
And I want to just for real quick. Yeah. I almost imagine it like we as humans, we have social security numbers in the, in the United States. So one day I could imagine that these social security numbers become NFTs that travel with us throughout our lives. And I had mentioned um, POAPs to you uh, a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Now POAPs are proof of attendance profiles. So they're basically like bookmarks of your life. They're, they're NFTs. Um, But in your basically social security NFT, you could wrap yourself and then somehow sub wrap your OS. And so with those <clears throat> mechanisms, you could literally track your life on the blockchain and all that you acquire as far as. I was happy to be a kid in the eighties because there weren't cameras when we made our mistakes. Like, I guess what I'm hearing and what I've heard people say is, right, if we bring this forward and it starts to become a real thing, how do you protect those guys that have deep bank accounts or assets and now pay somebody, you know, how do we, where does that information, where is that information protected or how is it protected to keep it from being, to keep from everybody knowing your dirty laundry or everybody knowing that, you know, hi, I'm in for a job interview and without without knowledge, I mean, it's printed on now my forehead that I've been in jail, for example, or that somebody's had a charge or, you know, what does that look like for public private record? And I know this is off, probably off subject and not related to ag or hemp, but these are things that, that I think limit some of the adoption because this lack of understanding about how to protect those assets. Right. So that's a great, great question and lots to unpack there. Now, we're just in this time period, this transitionary time period. So it's going to be a while before we see more of this and less of this. This being the legacy systems that we know and all that that entails. This being what's new and what's coming that we're creating real time. So the companies that have deep pockets, lots of IP, lots of all this and that, it's, it's going to be a while before it, it's that that's not going away. I don't see personally those those going away in in the near, near future. And we are going to figure out a way to. In a way, like folks that are are that exists now and companies that exist now, I imagine will be grandfathered in somehow to the new systems that we will have. Now, one big question that comes up though, surrounding this topic is, well, we have been in this world and this life experience where companies and you know, deep pockets, again, it comes back to trust and there's, there's certain things about that. Now there's good actors and there's bad actors. So in a world of block and public record keeping, you know, companies are going to have to, well, basically in that, in that scenario, they wouldn't have an opportunity to hide. Right. And so everything that they do would have to be really, really to the T so that their social equity doesn't go up in flame and retains value. Because one thing for sure is that as consumers, we may recognize companies and their bad actions and then stop putting our money towards those companies and in a way really harm them by doing that. So it's, it's a really interesting part of this topic because if we can imagine a world where companies are going to have to be very transparent with the rest of the world and all of its peoples, so that we can feel good about putting our money there, supporting them and what they do and the work that they do. And knowing that we, you know, knowing, knowing exactly what they're saying equates to what they're doing. And that is, uh, that plays plays a big, a big 
like I said, on the consumer, right? If I'm buying product, I want to know where it's coming from. And David had a really good comment earlier that I wanted to share. Um, it's the beauty of the blockchain used in farming and pharmaceuticals to trace back ingredients to source. So if they find E. coli on lettuce, they would be able to track it back to the row of the farm. I think that that's exactly where you know, I see so much opportunity, especially in the hemp industry or in agriculture is not only connecting those smart contracts direct from buyer to farm or you know product to manufacturer, but also to track base and hold accountable, right, for actions. But I also see this is exactly what we're up against when we talk about adoption of this technology, because it has been, it's such an issue. And we're just starting to unfold our bad practices and what they mean. And as businesses have built their business on bad practice intentionally or not, I can see this is a challenge to adopt to, right? Because it really is, it's unfolding that, but I think consumer is definitely still driving that. Right, right. In a big way. And it's like, it's exactly like you said, whether we know it or not. Um, most of the time we are, a lot of the time I believe we're innocent. Um, not always, but we just don't know. And then over time we realize, we learn, and then we try to repair the damage that we've done. And so that's the that's an ongoing, every day we learn something new. It's just continually ongoing. And so that's where that's kind of in this realm that we're at. Um, so where where would you like to see this? You know, we're at, we're at an hour, so I want to wrap up really quick. But I'm curious, like where in your in the ideal situation or even, you know, fastest to adoption or low-hanging fruit, what where would you like to see the usage of technology like this? And Well, that's a good question. Real quick, if I can, let me blast through another scenario. Yeah, please. So we, uh, we just talked about incentivizing the consumer. Well, we can also incentivize growing practices. So let's say I'm a brick and mortar store and I want the, I want a certain grade of material that fits certain parameters. And that's all I want in my store. I'm willing to pay high dollar. Let's say it's CBD raw flour. I want, I want to pay farmers a thousand dollars a pound for their CBD raw flour, but I only want raw flour, CBD, high CBD, uh, from farms that are a hundred miles of my brick and mortar store or from my e-commerce location. So I want to kind of support like my local economy. And then that farmer has to, in order to, <clears throat> for me to buy, has to meet certain parameters. They got to be certified USDA organic or in transition. Um, they have to be low plastic or no plastic. They got to be certain things. So in that way, I could create an NFT <clears throat> to incentivize farmers in a very limited amount, let's say like a hundred or 50. And so that NFT kind of may has a, has a chance to become highly sought after in my local economy for growers to, to be able to enter my store. Or let's say there's only 10 and I'm just supplying 10 farmers with a basically a you know revenue by buying product. Mm -hmm. So there's that digital scarcity, that digital collectability, and then also almost like a sub logo where it starts to become recognized in the industry. It's like, wow, you have that NFT as a grower. We know that you are supplying this store with that product and what that means. There's like a certain standard that's behind that NFT. So that I just wanted to blast that kind of a different uh, avenue of incentivization uh, just for the consumer and then also the grower um, <clears throat> by being a retail retailer. And for me, to circle back to what you're saying, where I would want it to all go, it's so young and I'm just learning. I'm just a sponge every day. Um, I, I, I don't have a super concrete answer. Other than that, I really like the idea of digital trust and I like the idea of 
personal financial education for myself and for er everyone. And that's always been a big thing for me. And so really knowing those mechanics, wh where my money's going, how it's being treated, how I'm treating it myself, and what is it driving? What's the back end? What's the front end? What's all the inner workings of us as communities, as a species, as a country, city, state, town, village, uh, municipality? Um, Man, imagine, imagine the data you'd be able to pull when it's accurately tracked like this on you know, socialism and actual behavior of within a community. I, I mean, that was just an aha moment that I <laughs> spoke out loud about. But I was like, oh, this is a, I mean, it really puts a completely different perspective on data collection or data collection. Right, right. That digital trust, it's yeah. hard to beat it. You know, it's hard to beat it because we are drifting further and further away from uh, trust as, as, as we feel comfortable with. And this is kind of a revitalization of trust is, is this technology. Awesome. So it's okay. kind of I real quick want to give a shout out. I saw Jennifer Roush, HubX. Uh, Jennifer, for those of you that don't know her, she's great. Connect with her. HubX 12 has an agriculture hemp asset back tokenization that rolls out in that rolls into retail. We figure out how to ultimately balance inflation and deflation of hemp production. The future is going to be very cool. I think that the hemp community has massive opportunity to help create change in a positive way. I want to highlight that last sentence because I think this is. I didn't realize what I was getting into when I got into hemp. And I specifically didn't realize that it would be directly related to the benefits or a tool to expedite blockchain or NFTs or climate change or sit at the table around huge real world problems. We are not just talking about this reefer madness or the change of allowing smoking, right? We were making real life big change. And so um, I'm really excited about the change that we have and the opportunity we have to bring forward and especially entering new tech. I mean, I I believe the next 1,000 unicorns are going to be in tech and climate change. Yeah, yeah. Hemp is, hemp is those things. And so that's it's, what's pretty cool. It's super cool, super cool. Like, what a time to be alive. We're having cannabis being fully, <laughs> almost legalized in a, a nationally and disrupting just about every industry globally. And then we also have blockchain, NFT, crypto tech that's doing similar work, disrupting almost every industry. So these two things at this time period in our lives, it's just incredible. And what a time to be alive. We get to do this and we get to be a part of it. And I'm just, I'm so incredibly excited about it. I had a great meeting yesterday. With some, I did not expect it to go this way. I went in. And he thanked me for thinking of him to provide the opportunity to make the change. You know, and it went from, hey, I want to introduce you to hemp to this aha moment that he was very grateful to be able to be a part of it. And so I encourage everybody to jump on. Obviously, I eat, breathe and sleep this and I love it. I'm very passionate about it. But um, Ryan, how do people get in touch with you if they have questions or if they want to get involved? Um, how do people connect with you? Oh, um, I can post my email address and that's the best way. Uh, just my email address. It's my first name, Ryan period. Piro is my last name at gmail.com. Um, that's the best way. And any questions, any insights, any thoughts, anything. Uh, and, and also on LinkedIn, the messaging there, uh, is great. And, um, if, if we are at the end here, I just want to take a minute and say thank you so much, Mandy, for your work, for hosting this space, and for having me uh, around to, to talk. Uh, I just can't thank you enough, and, and thank you so much. You're, you do such great work for, for cannabis, and thank you so much. My passion are the people. I love this opportunity. And it, it really, the more I got into it and people say, well, how come you're, how did you, why'd you get into hemp or, you know, what was your driving factor? And it really is that I saw opportunity and I saw opportunity to help other businesses, you know, become successful or get ahead of this trend because it's coming. And outside of the U S 
you know, in Glasgow right now, they are preaching, you know, screaming at the top of their voices about the importance about addressing the climate change. And so hemp is at the forefront of that. And it's exciting to be so exciting to have you involved. I'm excited to have your connections. I'm excited to have your insight. And so again, if anybody else has questions or wants help getting in touch with Ryan, um, log on to hemphallway.com. Hemphallway.com is our community platform. There's a few thousand people in there now, a few hundred people that are actively involved every week. And so you can log in and connect, search content. Um, and then of course, We'd love your support. Global Hemp Association for less than a cup of coffee every month. You can support us on Patreon. And then our memberships to get involved, have one-on-one -on -one and a, access to, an, uh, like I said, an entire network within our events and meetings. Um, it's on our website, globalhempassociation.org. And so without that being said, Ryan, we'll sign off. And are you going to be, I guess, let me remind everybody too, and I don't know if you're going to be there, but we've got a carbon discussion at one o'clock this afternoon. I'll share the Zoom link here in just a minute. But I'm excited. We've got Tyler Wood and Alan um, that they're going to present what they've been working on um, as far as the carbon drawdown and then have a couple of other guests to really chime in on unfolding. How do we do this and what does the carbon credit look like and how is it tracked and what does it mean for farmer and manufacturer and then that in consumer product? And so I welcome everybody to join. But without yeah. that. And thank you. And oh, just real quick, Mandy, is that because it's one it's one here. So are you in mid time? Is it oh. is, is it going to be three o'clock Eastern? Good call. One o'clock Mountain Time, three o'clock Eastern. OK, great, because I'm really I'm trying to be there. Uh, I'll try my hardest. I'll send you a text reminder. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, you guys. Well, Bye, thank everybody. You. Talk soon.